Good. Uh, the topic here is uh, the linearized Laplace approximation in Bayesian neural networks. This was one of the first uh, techniques that was used uh, to work with Bayesian neural networks. It was developed by David Mackay, who was a professor here in Cambridge in the Cavendish Laboratory, which is just uh, a few hundred meters maybe that way. Uh, and then later he was in the Department of Engineering. Uh, we're going to see uh, the fundamentals of this method. And uh, we're going to see that it actually works uh, very well. And it's one of the best uh, techniques, in my opinion, at the moment to get accurate uncertainties uh, with uh, neural networks. Um, so the outline for the tutorial is as follows. We're going to start with a brief motivation for a Bayesian approach and why we may want to be Bayesian. Uh, we're going to see uh, the basics of the Laplace approximation, which will allow us to work in practice with uh, models where uh, Bayesian computations are not tractable. The Laplace approximation will allow us to approximate uh, integrals. Um, we're going to see how to implement this in neural networks. We're going to review some of the work of uh, David Mackay, and we're going to look at the, the content that he had in his uh, thesis. Uh, David Mackay had an amazing PhD thesis. He described this Laplace approximation, how to apply to Bayesian neural networks, and how to do uh, model selection uh, using uh, the approximation of the model evidence given by this Laplace approximation. Uh, we are going to move forward a bit and we are going to see some uh, more recent works on this topic. There has been a lot of interesting papers coming recently on this topic. Uh, one of them by Alex Imer, who is a PhD student who is here. We're going to see some of his work uh, here. Um, and then uh, I will describe some of the recent work done in the, by some uh, PhD students in collaboration with me uh, on how to scale up the Laplace approximation, how to uh, improve the performance of this method in uh, modern neural networks. And finally, we are going to see a, an application of these techniques to the problem of uh, reconstruction of medical images from measurements. For example, X-ray images. You may have a small number of measurements and you want to uh, obtain the, the corresponding image uh, from, from just uh, the, the sensor measurements that you obtain. And we're going to see how you can use this uh, linearized Laplace approximation to obtain uncertainties uh, for the reconstruction of, of these images. Good, so this is the uh, content of what we are going to see. Uh, we can see uh, first a brief motivation for a Bayesian approach. Uh, we are going to focus on the problem of binary classification. We just have, for example, this data set. Uh, there are two types of points, uh, red points, uh, blue points. And we may want to find a classifier that separates the data. This classifier is going to be a straight line. And we want to find the parameters of this straight line that will uh, classify the data uh, well. And we could choose a, a separating hyperplane. Uh, this could be a classifier. It actually separates all the training data perfectly. But actually, there are other classifiers that could separate the data as well. No? Instead of this one, we could have chosen this one. Uh, they both have zero error on the training data, even this one. This one maybe is not so good, no? It looks like, uh, yeah, it separates the data, but maybe if I get new data points, maybe this classifier could make errors on those data points, especially if I get new data points, for example, blue data points in this area or red data points in this area. So maybe I wouldn't like to choose this classifier if I had to solve a prediction problem. Um, this could be another one, another one. This is also another one that separates the data, but it doesn't look so good either. Uh, so uh, maybe this one looks a bit better, no? It seems to be uh, more likely to make better predictions if I get new data points from the blue class or the red class. Uh, so in general, uh, what happens is that there are many classifiers that could uh, separate the data, the training data equally well. Uh, and a priori, I don't have any particular reason to choose one of them. So what I could do uh, to deal with this problem is to follow a Bayesian approach. I could specify a prior probability on the coefficients of my classifier, uh, 
this pile, for example, this could be just a spherical Gaussian with some width. This prior is going to be, um, let's see. So this prior here is just a spherical Gaussian. So if you plot the contours of this, they're going to be more or less like that. Apologies for my <laughs> poor writing. Uh, but uh, in principle, I don't have any preferred direction for my classifier. All these classifiers, they go through the origin and uh, any point here is going to be just uh, the vector that is orthogonal to the classifier and it's going to just determine the direction of my classifier. So this prior is just saying, a priori any classifier is equally likely. And I could consider all the possible classifiers uh, to separate my data. Um, we can combine that uh, prior with a likelihood function that specifies how well the classifier fits the data. Uh, in this case, we're using a logistic function to map the, the product of my hyperplane with a data point uh, to the unit interval. And this is going to give me the probability of the class label. Uh, so this is just the probability of the class label being uh, one or minus one. The labels are one or minus one. And this is just the sigmoid function. And here, maybe, uh, I'm using a property of, this, of the logistic function or the, of, uh, let me see, where is this? Uh, so here I'm using a property, which is that sigma of minus X is equal to one minus sigma of X. Uh, and I can write just compactly what's going on there. No, it's, this is just the probability. Uh, if, y, if Y is one, this is, this is just sigma W X. And if y is minus one, this is just a one minus sigma wx. So it's just the probability that it's either class one, or if it is a class minus one, it has to be the same as one minus the probability of class uh, minus one. Uh, so anyway, I can multiply these things, the prior and my likelihood, and I get a posterior. And this posterior distribution weights uh, each classifier accordingly to how well it describes the data and my prior assumptions. And to make predictions, I will just consider now all possible classifiers um, uh, with priority proportional to this posterior distribution. So I'm going to consider all possible values of W. That's why I'm integrating here and I'm weighting each one by this posterior distribution. And uh, then I'm looking at the predictions that I obtain by each of these classifiers once I average over uh, all of them. Uh, by the way, if there is any question at any time, feel free to interrupt. I will be very happy to answer and to try to clarify anything. Uh, so when you do that, you will be considering all these classifiers that could be separated in the data. And I will be weighting each one by their uh, posterior probability. Those classifiers that make mistakes are going to have very low errors. And I won't be considering uh, much those for making predictions and those that make uh, uh, very few errors on the training data, uh, I will be giving them more weight. So these are all the classifiers uh, that could be separated in the data without making any errors. Um, and in the end, I will be averaging the predictions of all these classifiers. And we obtain a predictive distribution uh, as uh, this. So this, this could be this predictive distribution. I am just plotting it here. Uh, and we find something interesting. Uh, now I get a separating hyperplane or decision boundary. This in orange, this could be the decision boundary where my probabilities go from 0 0.5 from one class. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's the, the point at which my predictive probability is 0 0.5. And if it is smaller than 0 0.5, I will be predicting one class. And if it is larger than 0 0.5, I will be predicting the other class. We find here two interesting things. Uh, we have high uncertainty in these regions. These are regions far away from the data. In those regions, I don't have much confidence that the class could be blue or red. I'm far from the data points. And then my predictive distribution is accounting for this uncertainty in my predictions. And if you think about What's happening here, the predictive probabilities are closer to 0 0.5 in this region. So I am more uncertain. 
And once I am close to the red points, the predictive probabilities are closer to one for class uh, red, saying I'm confident here that the predictions are red. And the same here, I'm confident that the predictions are blue. Uh, this is different if you just consider a point estimate for your classifier. Um, you could say, I just look at a point estimate for my classifier, it's going to be just uh, maybe this one that I like. Uh, and then I look at the predictive probabilities and actually the probabilities, because I am using the logistic function, the probabilities only uh, depend on the distance to the hyperplane. It doesn't matter exactly where I am, if I am here close to the data or if I am far away from the data, my predictive probabilities only de depend on the distance to the, to the uh, hyperplane W that I have chosen as a point estimate. This would be like the map solution, the point estimate that maximizes the likelihood, the log likelihood plus the log prior. Uh, and here we don't have this higher uncertainty far away from the data. I could be actually far, far away from the data and make quite confident predictions. For example, if I am just in this region and I go farther away from the data, I will make the same confident predictions. Um, this is something that doesn't happen with a Bayesian approach. I think that having access to these probabilities can be quite useful uh, to obtain more reliable uh, methods. Uh, good, so all this sounds great. Yes, one question. Good question. Uh, yeah, so let's have a look at this. Uh, sorry. So the question is this. Uh, this is uh, this distribution is the predictive distribution is the probability that your model gives to the class label once you integrate out the model parameters according to this posterior. And the question is, can you do this in practice? The answer is only in very few cases. Uh, if your model is simple, you might be able to obtain an analytic solution for this. Uh, for example, if you have a linear model with Gaussian noise and Gaussian priors, then you will be able to do this exactly. In general, you won't be able to do this. And this means that you will need to do approximations. And this is precisely the topic of this uh, lecture that I'm giving here. Uh, these uh, distributions, the posterior, on W and then integrating with respect to that posterior is going to be intractable and we need to do approximations. Yes. Uh, yes, you could uh, do Monte Carlo. There is like a ton of methods that you could use uh, to approximate these integrals. You could do Monte Carlo, you could do variational inference. Uh, um, there are many, many, many techniques for this. Uh, we are going to see Today, one which is based on this uh, Laplace approximation, and we're going to see uh, how to do that. Uh, so our topic is going to be to approximate this type of integrals using uh, the Laplace approximation. Um, yeah, the main idea behind the Laplace approximation is actually extremely simple. You may have something complicated and non-Gaussian like this distribution here shown in orange. And you may want to approximate that with a Gaussian. Gaussians are simple distributions and very often integrating with respect to Gaussians is simple. We could also easily draw samples from Gaussians uh, and working with Gaussians, it's, it's usually nice in practice. So we, we are happy with that. And then what we're going to focus is on finding a Gaussian approximation to a complicated distribution such as this uh, orange one. Um, one approach to do this was proposed by uh, Pierre Simon Laplace. Uh, he used uh, this uh, technique to do integrals. He was not focusing on, on solving expectations with respect to complicated probability distributions. Uh, his integrals were about uh, anything. They, they, the, the stuff that you wanted to integrate could be like this as a sync function and not a Gaussian. Uh, we are going to focus on the case where the, the, the thing that we want to integrate with respect to is, is a Gaussian. Um, so we want to approximate this with a Gaussian and the question is, how do we identify the Gaussian? The Gaussian is determined by its mean, function, its mean uh, parameter and its uh, variance or covariance uh, parameters. And uh, we need to find a value for those. So how we are going to do this? Um, we are going to see an example here with a, a one-dimensional problem. 
what we are going to do for the mean is we are going to look at the maximum of the target distribution in orange that we want to approximate. And we are going to place the mean of our Gaussian, which is also the maximum of our Gaussian at the same point. So we are going to find the maximum a posteriori value of the parameters of interest by optimizing the curve in orange. This is the input that maximizes that value. And then we are going to place the mean of our Gaussian at the same point. So the maximum of my Gaussian agrees with the maximum of my complicated distribution. And this, this complicated distribution, FW, is, is going to be typically unnormalized and it's going to come from the product of some likelihood function that describes the probability of the data given my parameters and some prior. You multiply these two things and you get a joint distribution, the probability of the data and my model parameters. Uh, this is not normalized, so it doesn't really integrate to one. There is some normalization constant here, which I'm going to call Z. And this normalization constant is usually the probability of the data uh, given by my model. So we only have access to F, just the, the unnormalized distribution that comes from multiplying the prior and the likelihood. And we can easily optimize this using numerical methods. I could use just a numerical optimizer, maybe gradient-based methods, and I optimize this. I can then choose the mean of my Gaussian to be just the maximizer of F. That's uh, quite easy uh, to do. It will be just the, the input for which the gradient of my target is, is zero. And I could use any optimization algorithm for solving this problem. So, so far, uh, it's relatively simple to apply this. Now, the question is what I'm going to choose for the balance. I have already chosen the location of my mean in my Gaussian, and now I have to choose the width of my Gaussian. Should it be very broad, the Gaussian? Should it be very small? I have to make a decision here. Um, now, how does the Laplace approximation solve this problem? Uh, so what we are going to do is a, a Taylor approximation of uh, the log of my target, uh, this probability. So F, I'm going to take the log and I'm going to do a Taylor approximation. Just I ignore the log for, for simplicity and assume that I do a Taylor approximation of my function, for example, Fx at some point, F, uh, at some point X equal to uh, A. And then I'm going to have here now uh, terms that depend on the derivatives of my function. And then I have maybe here more additional terms. This is the second derivative. Uh, and uh, so on. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is wrong. This would be two. And then I would have here additional terms. Uh, this is the second derivative. Good. Uh, so I could continue that series, but what I'm going to do is to truncate the series. And I'm going to consider only the first uh, terms. Uh, I'm going to do the Taylor approximation at the mode of my target distribution. And this means that this gradient here is going to be zero. So I can ignore this, uh, this, this term is going to be zero. So I can ignore that. And then I'm going to have just a constant and then this quadratic term. And what I will be doing is working on the log of my distribution. And then my Taylor approximation is going to be the log of my constant. And then I have here the quadratic term. Um, and now one interesting thing is that Gaussians are exponentials of quadratic functions. And I have now here that the log of my approximation is a quadratic function, which is just a Gaussian, precisely what I needed. Uh, so uh, you can also look at this uh, quadratic, quadratic term that I get here. And there is this W map which is going to agree with the mean of my Gaussian. Now, typically in a Gaussian, you have exponential of minus one half, x 
minus the mean squared divided by the balance. So this is the mean of my Gaussian. And then uh, A here is going to be the inverse balance. Um, so just to, this is going to be the inverse. Uh, balance of my Gaussian, and then uh, this is going to be the mean. Now that I, so I have the, let me see. So there is a minus sign here, and then uh, this is the, the derivative that comes from the Taylor approximation. I just added two minus there, because in Gaussians you typically have minus one half. So I just included the minus one half here. And now this A is just the inverse balance in my Gaussian and it's just uh, minus the second derivative of the log of uh, my target distribution. So now I have everything I need to come up with my Gaussian approximation. I know that it's going to be a Gaussian whose mean is going to be the maximizer of my target distribution. And the variance is going to be related to uh, the uh, second derivative of this uh, log target density. Uh, I could take here exponential and I get Fw, and now it's approximated by uh, F evaluated at the map solution. And then I have the exponential of this quadratic term, and this is precisely a Gaussian. Uh, my approximation then is going to be a Gaussian with mean the maximizer of the map and uh, variance uh, the inverse of the second derivative of the target. Now, this is not normalized. This QT there here, it's a Gaussian, but without, uh, without integrating to one. Now, this is just the exponential of a quadratic function. Uh, and if I want this to integrate one, I have to divide by the normalization constant. And this is just a constant here, FW map, that multiplies. And now this exponential of a quadratic function, computing the normalization of constant of that is extremely easy. It's just the normalization constant of a Gaussian. No? So a Gaussian is going to be uh, x m v. This is going to be 1 over square root of 2 pi v exponential minus 1 half. Uh, x minus m squared. No? So the normalization constant can be found here. So it's just a, a 1 over 2 pi uh, balance, uh, the square root, 1 over the square root of 2 pi uh, and the balance of my Gaussian. So uh, the normalizer of my uh, approximation is just that is two pi times uh, the valence, which is one over this second derivative here. Uh, so that's then great. I have an approximation that is Gaussian to my complicated distribution. And I can also approximate the integral of my unnormalized target distribution by just uh, normalizing this uh, Gaussian approximation. And uh, uh, the normalization constant is going to be the target density evaluated at the map solution and then multiplied by the normalization constant of my gas. Any questions so far? What do you say the mean of the Gaussian to be the maximizer of the unknown? That's right. You do it because uh, yeah, it's an arbitrary choice that you do. You could have done it as a choice, but it, it seems reasonable, no? I mean, if you have to place... Uh, let me see if this is shown here. If you have to place the, your Gaussian somewhere, you probably want to place it in regions where you have high probability, no? So you just make that choice. You could have done other choices, but that's like a simple one. And it has the advantage that uh, you can then do the, the Taylor approximation around this point, and then you get, you get the nice quadratic form for Gaussians uh, shown here. Uh, how do you get the mean of the target? If you can maximize it, you can also do something. How do you get the mean? It's not as straightforward. No? Someone gives you a normalized distribution. 
uh, you can evaluate the density, but what's the mean? You would need to integrate. No? You can do a Monte Carlo approximation. Uh, yes, uh, but that might not be straightforward. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you could do other approximations. Uh, cool. So let's have a look at how this looks in practice. Uh, we have now our target distribution, which is not Gaussian. Here is, this one is asymmetric, and it has some tail here that is larger than the other one. We find the input that maximizes that distribution. We take the log, and then at the map of my target, I'm going to now place a quadratic function. And this quadratic function, shown in blue, it has the maximum at the same location as the original target uh, density. But when I take the exponential, my approximation, which was quadratic, now is Gaussian. And uh, the mean of my Gaussian is just the, the maximizer of the target. And the second derivative of my log Gaussian is the same at the map solution as the second derivative of the target. Uh, great. Uh, so this is how the Laplace approximation works. Um, now, this is a toy problem in 1D. Uh, you want to do this in higher dimensions. Uh, what do you do in that case? Uh, pretty much the same. You can still do a Taylor approximation in higher dimensions. The only thing now that you have to be a bit more careful is that instead of having just a single scalar as the second derivatives, you have now a matrix of second derivatives because you can take derivatives with respect to pairs of variables. No? And then this is going to be now the Hessian of your log target uh, density minus the log target density. Uh, you have now the same constant at the beginning and then you have this quadratic function that is centered at uh, W map, the maximizer of my target uh, density. So now the minus log, minus the Hessian of the log density now is the inverse covariance matrix in my Gaussian. Now in a multivariate Gaussian, you have uh, minus one half as before, and now the vector of random variables minus the mean, transpose times the inverse covariance matrix in my Gaussian times the other vector. Uh, and uh, I take the exponential of this. This is now an unnormalized multivariate Gaussian. And now I can normalize this very easily by noting that the normalization constant of a multivariate Gaussian is going to be uh, the square root of uh, two pi uh, to the d and then times the uh, determinant of the covariance matrix of my Gaussian. Uh, and now uh, this is going to be the uh, normalization constant of my multivariate Gaussian. Uh, the covariance matrix is now going to be the inverse of the Hessian, and that's shown here. Great, so it's more or less the same stuff, but I just have to work with uh, matrices and vectors. Uh, and I have some determinants there, but nothing uh, to worry about. Uh, cool. Any reasons why this could fail in practice? Can anyone say something why this might not be maybe the, the best thing to do? That's right. So the target distribution could be multimodal. It could have multiple modes. When I am finding this Laplace approximation, I'm focusing just at a single point in my distribution, the one that maximizes that, and it could be a local minima, a local maxima, sorry. Uh, so if you think about what I need to do this, I just uh, find some maximizer of my target, and everything I, I use is just the second derivative there, and I ignore the rest of my distribution. So. It's like, that's why sometimes you say that this Laplace approximation is a local approximation because it focuses just at this input that maximizes the target and it ignores everything else around you. And if you have a multipolar distribution, uh, things might not be so good. Uh, now we have said that we're going to use this to approximate uh, the posterior distribution in neural networks. And neural networks are well known to be having extremely multimodal posteriors. Uh, that may seem to say, okay, maybe this method is not so good in that setting. Uh, we're going to see what happens when we apply this method to neural networks. Uh, 
Cool. Any questions? Uh, no? Good. So we're going to see now an example. We're going to go back to the classification problem that we saw at the beginning, and we are going to come up with a Laplace approximation to the posterior distribution in that problem. So in our problem, uh, recall, we had this uh, prior, which was Gaussian, some uh, logistic function that is used to map uh, real numbers to probabilities, and it gives me the, the likelihood by multiplying these logistic functions. We are going to apply the Laplace approximation to this. I need first to maximize the log of this. I can do that using numerical methods, gradient-based optimization. Uh, I could use uh, second-order optimizers to solve this. In practice, to solve uh, logistic regression problems, uh, to find the map solution, you will use uh, iteratively weighted least squares, which is just second-order a second order method. Uh, so you could do that to maximize this quantity, and then you need the Hessian of this, uh, of the log of this. No, you need to take the log of this and compute the Hessian of that. Uh, so uh, you can actually do that analytically. So let's have a look at this. We have now the product of the likelihood and the prior. That's my target. I'm taking the log of that. Uh, this is going to be the, the function that I maximize. I find the map solution for that, and then I compute the Hessian at that location. And you can show that that Hessian can be computed analytically, and it's given by this expression. You just have a sum over data points. This is the outer product of the feature vectors for the data points, and there are some extra terms here. And there is some extra term that comes from the prior. Uh, my Gaussian approximation is going to be having mean the map uh, as shown here. And then as uh, covariance matrix is just the inverse of this Hessian of the negative uh, log uh, target F. Uh, pretty straightforward to do. You can see how it looks in practice. It will look something like this. This represents the true posterior. Uh, I'm finding the map shown as this blue point. And now I'm finding a Gaussian that has the same second uh, derivative at that point, and it's shown here on this plot. Uh, it seems to do a pretty good job in this region. Maybe in this other region, it doesn't do such a great fit, but maybe that's still fine. Uh, we can see how this works in practice. Uh, um, Maybe we can see this first. Uh, uh, so actually, it does a very good job um, approximating the, the true posterior. This shows the true posterior on the right, and this shows the Laplace approximation. And we get these nice uh, uncertainties uh, at the end on the extremes when I am far away from the data, which looks great. Uh, there is one small detail that I didn't mention on how to obtain this predictive distribution. I have my Gaussian approximation, and to obtain predictions, I need to integrate the predictions of my model with respect to this uh, approximate posterior. This is a logistic function, and this is a Gaussian. And I need to obtain the result of this integral. Uh, you don't have an analytic solution for this. Um, so what we are going to do is to use an approximation, which was actually the same approximation this is actually the same approximation used by David Mackay to, to solve this problem. Uh, so we have this uh, posterior predictive distribution. We need to integrate a Gaussian with respect to the logistic function. Uh, there is no analytic solution for this, but it turns out that the logistic function is very similar to the cumulative probability of a Gaussian, which is called the probit function. And actually, you can integrate a probit function with respect to a Gaussian. Uh, you have the solution here. If you have a Gaussian with mean uh, m and variance v, and I want to integrate my probit function, maybe with some scaling constant here, I have an analytic solution. And it's given by, by this quantity. I won't go into the details. But it's basically the probit function evaluated at the mean, and now it's divided by the square root of my valence in my Gaussian, and there is some constant here that comes from the scaling 
constant lambda. But anyway, I can use then this approximation to come up with a solution to this integral shown here. The key thing is that this scaling constant in my probit is chosen so that the slope of my probit is the same as the logistic function here at the origin. Uh, I just do a small scaling of the, of the probit so that it's as close as possible in this region to the logistic function. And I have now here the integral of my probit and a Gaussian, and I have here now the integral of a logistic function and a Gaussian, and I can just uh, do an approximation. And here I have a logistic function, uh, a probit function, and I can approximate it also with a logistic. And in the end, if I do this, I just approximate uh, one term here, another term here. What I get is that the integral of my logistic function with respect to a Gaussian can be approximated by the logistic function, evaluated on the mean of my Gaussian, divided now by this square root that includes the variance of my Gaussian here as an extra term. Uh, this is super important, this extra term that we get here, which is uh, some uh, variance. Uh, and we're going to see why in the next slide. So, now in my probit model, I can just use exactly the, this approximation to come up with uh, an approximation to the predictions of my Bayesian model. And what is interesting is that now uh, I have here we, what would be the input to a logistic function when I make deterministic predictions. If I ignore uncertainty and I just find the map solution, uh, in my logistic classifier, I would be just taking this, evaluating uh, the dot product between my, by, between my hyperplane W and the input features and feeding that into the logistic function. And I would make predictions. That's, that's what you get when you make predictions as the map uh, with the map uh, point estimate. So to have a look at that, what I was getting here, these predictions are obtained just by taking the logistic function and evaluating at uh, w times x. And I don't take into account uncertainties. Now, uh, here I have now some variance that comes from uh, my Gaussian. So I, I have a Gaussian approximation on w, and w times x is going to be Gaussian as well, with mean w map times x and variance this quantity x times the covariance matrix of my Gaussian times x. And now this thing is going to be positive and it's going to be large if I'm actually uh, far away from the data. Um, so the variance is going to increase in regions far away from the data. And that's why here you have uh, this uh, higher uncertainty because this variance term is large. And when you are closer to the data, that's not going to be the case. Uh, so anyway, that's how you obtain uncertainties in this case using this simple approximation. This same approximation that we used with this uh, logistic uh, regression model is the same that we are going to use with neural networks. Um, cool. Any questions uh, so far on this? Yes. Uh, the functions are not on slide 22. 22. The functions are not 1, 1. So how we can take the inverse of the function? Uh, yes, you are not taking the inverse of the function. You are just taking the exponential. So here you just take, uh, this is the log of f. And to go to here, you just take the exponential of the log of f. And you just get f. And my second question is we are usually using the uh, loss of origination for the exact solution. Can you repeat the question? You are using the. Actually, the loss is usually used for the exact solution. The mass or. The loss matter. I must be uh, uh, about the loss matter that it is being used for the. Exact solution. Yeah, what the question is what method we use for the exact solution uh, here? So if we are using the uh, 
battle for the exact solution. So automatically the exact solution and the same solution to the loss will be matched. No, they are not the same. They look very similar, but they are not the same. You are saying that because of this plot that they look very similar here. They are not the same. So they look very similar, but they are not the same uh, because one is based on the Gaussian approximation, which is not correct. Uh, I mean, you can see it here in this plot that they are not, they are not the same. Uh, I think I'm not fully getting your question. Uh, could you try to clarify it a bit more? <laughs> Sorry, uh, we, we are using the Laplace transformation for the solution of yes. the exact solution. Yes, so uh, this, is, this is the Laplace approximation and it's different from the Laplace transform. So they are completely different things. Uh, so you, you shouldn't, you, yeah, we, we won't get into that. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, Good, so now that, yes. Yes. So here we say there is uh, some asymmetry in the exact, exact solution, but in the Laplace approximation, it is symmetric. So is there any way to account for asymmetric? Because yeah, so yeah, so I mean, if you see here, this is asymmetric, no? So you have, you have like larger bands. With a Gaussian, there is no way you can do that. <laughs> your Gaussian is going to be symmetric. And uh, what is going to happen in practice is that your target distributions won't be symmetric. Uh, yeah, so there is not much you can do in that setting unless you go to other approximations. I mean, there are methods that, I mean, you could have a more flexible approximation and you could use something like variational methods. Uh, and then you could try to fit a variational approximation that ca can capture those asymmetries. And if, you're, if in your problem, these asymmetries are important, then maybe those methods work better than the, the Laplace so approach. If you fit it with a, a, with the covariance matrix, that you cannot do much. I mean, it's always symmetric. It doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> the, the covariance matrix is going to, sh to change the shape of your Gaussian. It's going to stretch the density in some directions and shrink it in, in others, but it's going to be still symmetric. Cool. Uh, so now we are going to see how to do this, the same technique in the Bayesian neural networks. Uh, and uh, the application of the Laplace approximation to Bayesian neural networks was uh, first proposed by David Mackay. I have included here a picture of him. He actually developed all these techniques for his PhD thesis, which is, I think, an amazing work. He had just application of the Laplace approximation to Bayesian neural networks. He had then uh, an amazing work done on uh, model selection based on the um, normalization constant in, in the posterior distribution of these neural networks. He showed how to approximate this with the Laplace approximation as well. And he showed also how to do hyperparameter tuning, optimizing that quantity. And that was something kind of revolutionary at the moment because everyone with neural networks was doing hyperparameter tuning using cross validation. But now, you could follow a Bayesian approach. You could compute the probability that a particular model gives to the data once you integrate the parameters, and you could tune hyperparameters optimizing that quantity. And as uh, Mark mentioned before, by using this uh, marginal likelihood, you are able to avoid the uh, overfitting problems. Um, so David Mackay actually came up with a way to tune hyperparameters in Bayesian neural networks, like the prior variances. Uh, using this uh, technique of maximizing the marginal likelihood, the, the approximation of the model evidence given by the Laplace approximation. And his way was to tune now, not uh, just a single scalar for the prior variance, which is what most people were doing at that time, just to, to tune that by cross validation. Now he had an objective and he could uh, try to uh, optimize numerically that objective. Uh, this could be done then fast, and uh, you could then tune many hyperparameters, not just one. David Mackay um, came up with a way to tune now prior variances for different inputs to your neural network. You could have your neural network, and then you have weights in your neural network, and you could say that all the weights that receive the same feature, the first feature as input, could have a shared variance. And uh, then you have now, for each of the inputs to your neural network, you have one prior variance and you could 
tune that prior balance to shrink those weights. And that's going to determine how sensitive your neural network is to those inputs. This is often called automatic relevance determination in other settings. So David McKay, he applied this method to a machine learning competition at that time in 1993, and he obtained the best solution in that competition. He won this competition just by using his methods uh, for Bayesian neural networks. And he, he became well known, well known because of this. Um, this is a plot of his uh, thesis, and he shows now some a small toy data set, now the feed that he would obtain with a neural network, and now some nice confidence bands that he, he obtained using this Laplace approximation technique. Uh, other things, David McGuire wrote this book, Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms. This was a reference, and it's still a reference book in machine learning. Uh, when I started my PhD, this was kind of one of the main machine learning books at that time. And uh, now you have more recent books, uh, but this is still like a, a super important book in my opinion. And then he worked also on uh, uh, um, uh, sustainable energy and just uh, studying uh, uh, like the, the amount of uh, carbon that the different energy sources would be producing. And he wrote this also another amazing book that is very well known. This is not related to machine learning, but it's very well known. Uh, as well. Anyway, we're going to see now uh, how to apply these techniques in, in neural networks. Uh, and uh, we're going to see that actually this Laplace approximation works extremely well in neural networks. And it's something counterintuitive. No, you wouldn't expect that just a Gaussian would be a good approximation to the posterior distribution in neural networks. We're going to see uh, why actually this is the case and why, why the Laplace approximation actually works uh, so well. So let's uh, have a look at the, the problem. The problem is very similar to what we have seen before. Uh, we have now inputs, uh, x, feature vectors, and targets, y. We're going to assume that y are just a scalar, so we are solving a regression problem to keep things simple, but they could be uh, binary labels as, as before. And now uh, we are going to assume Gaussian noise. So we assume that the network is going to come up with some output uh, given the input xn and its weights, the output neuron will get some value. And I assume that y is just a, a corrupted version of the output of the network with Gaussian noise. And I assume that the noise has this uh, inverse balance. Uh, let's see, this is the uh, noise precision. is just the inverse balance of my Gaussian noise. Uh, we are going to assume also a Gaussian prior on the weights, the same stuff that we did with the binary classifier before. Now we do the same and we have some uh, inverse precision for the uh, for this uh, prior on the, on the weights. Uh, I take now my log prior and my log likelihood. I sum them and I get this log posterior. And to apply the Laplace approximation, we just need to do what I mentioned before. We need to find the input W that maximizes this quantity. And then uh, I will need some uh, matrix of second derivatives uh, there. Uh, so we are going to find W map is the input that maximizes the, uh, the log posterior. And then I'm going to get now some covariance matrix for my Gaussian, which is now the matrix of second derivatives of minus the log posterior, which is just given by this quantity. I get this term that comes from the prior. Uh, this comes from the prior. Uh, and then this is just the, the Hessian of my log likelihood. Now, that's for my Gaussian approximation. Uh, I, could do, I could find W map using some numerical optimization method. I could then approximate or get this uh, Hessian uh, A using different techniques. David Mackay we used, for example, uh, numerical differences. You could compute gradients very easily. And now uh, for obtaining this matrix, you could do just numerical differences. You, at that time, you didn't have like uh, automatic differentiation tools. So if you had to compute second derivatives, it was not something super straightforward to do at that time. So 
you could use different techniques uh, that doesn't really require that. And one way is, for example, numerical uh, differences for approximations. Cool. Uh, then you may want to obtain the model evidence, the normalization constant in base rule. Uh, and that's uh, what we saw before. Uh, the model, the approximation of the model evidence was the value of my log posterior at the map solution. And that's what I, we have here. This is the log likelihood at the map solution. And this, this is the log prior at the map solution. So uh, maybe just to make it clear this part here. This is what we were calling FW map before. Uh, and then here I have the log determinant of my covariance metrics in my Gaussian. Uh, good. When you look at this, you get some insights on why this marginal likelihood might be useful uh, to the model selection. Uh, what you find is that there are some terms that represent how well your model fits the data, like this one. And then there are other terms that are going to penalize model complexity. You have this term that is going to favor the weights to be small. And in neural networks, usually small weights represent the smooth functions. So this is going to enforce a smoothness. And then this log determinant is going to uh, penalize model complexity. If my model is uh, very complex and I have some weights that are kind of loose, uh, this means that the second derivative of the map solution, if you look at the curvature at the map solution, is going to be quite flat. If my model is very big and it doesn't really, uh, is fully determined by the data, I'm going to have some uh, directions that are kind of loose and I could change the weights and my predictions don't really change much how they, they describe the data. So this log determinant is going to penalize uh, that. Uh, um, and the, by, sorry, by optimizing this quantity, we will be able to find models that actually work well in practice. Uh, so now, that sounds good. Now we still have to make predictions. And in the previous example with the linear model, it was relatively simple. I had uh, some Gaussian on W and to make predictions, I just multiply my hyperplane W with the input X. It's just a linear dot product. And if I want to compute the distribution of that, it's very simple. It's just a linear operation. W is Gaussian. That, that thing is going to be Gaussian as well. Now with neural networks, it's not so simple. With neural networks, I have my uh, posterior that I approximate with a Gaussian. And now I have to integrate the predictions of my neural network with respect to a Gaussian. Um, and you don't have an analytic solution for that. Before we use this approximation with the probit, but that was kind of a super simple setting. Now here I have a completely, a very complicated function. Function. This is an inner network. Uh, computing the, the distribution of this when W is sampled from a Gaussian could be something crazy and very complicated. I don't have an analytic solution. David, my guy, was really smart and he came up with a simple approximation. His approximation was just saying, okay, I cannot integrate nonlinear functions with respect to a Gaussian, but I can integrate linear functions with respect to a Gaussian. So let's linearize the output of my linear network at a particular input X around my map solution. And this is now a first order Taylor approximation of the output of the network around uh, um, W map. So this is the output of the network times the gradient of the output of the network with respect to W at W map times the difference. And this is now a linearized uh, model. Uh, I can now replace my original model here with a linearized approximation. And now this is linear in W and I know what is the expectation of W and what is the covariance matrix of W. And I can very easily then approximate my predictive distribution with a Gaussian with mean M star, which is just the output of the network at W map. And then with some uh, balance that is uh, similar 
to what I had before in a binary classifier. Now, instead of X, I have now these gradient uh, features here. So now this has an advantage. First, the predictions of my Bayesian approach are the same as the predictions of the deterministic method that finds the map solution. And this is usually good. Uh, if I have if I have a good method to, to train my network, I can just, and I know that a training a deterministic network works well, then uh, I will be able to apply this. Uh, and my point estimates with my Bayesian approach are the same. And now I have this extra term that is going to increase uncertainty uh, depending on how these uh, gradient vectors uh, match this uh, covariance matrix here. Uh, so that's it. Uh, it sounds like a weird thing to do. Don't you think like linearizing this model? Uh, I mean, David Mackay did this in the 90s, uh, but I'm pretty sure he knew how to sample from Gaussians. No? So you can easily sample from a multivariate Gaussian. And then this is just an integral. You could approximate it with Monte Carlo very easily. The question is, why do you think David Mackay didn't do this? Why did he come up with this complicated thing of linearizing the model? Sounds a bit strange. Uh, and there is a very good reason why he didn't do that. Um, we are going to see soon why that's the case. Uh, but let's, 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 let's look at how this works in practice. Uh, this shows some predictive distributions with this model. Um, this is some toy data, and uh, you have now some nice curves that fit the data. Uh, the predictions, these point estimates are the same as the deterministic approach, and now you get nice confidence bands. Um, this is another network. It works uh, quite well. Uh, now, why use a linearized model for prediction? Uh, we could also approximate this with sampling. And uh, there is someone that already did this. Uh, it was uh, Neil Lawrence. Neil Lawrence is actually a professor uh, here in this department. Uh, we actually, he, he was supposed to give a lecture in this summer school, but we had to change the time for the summer school from one week to another and then things didn't work for him. So he couldn't be here to give a lecture. Uh, Neil Lawrence did his, his PhD here in Cambridge. His supervisor was uh, Chris Bishop, who is the uh, director of the Microsoft Research Center here in Cambridge. He has this work on uh, neural networks. It was a, a quite well-known book uh, before this deep learning revolution. Uh, and uh, Chris Bishop and Neil Lawrence, they actually worked on neural networks. Uh, the PhD thesis of Neil Lawrence is actually about variational inference on neural networks. Uh, we may have PhD students from Neil here. Is, there, is anyone a PhD student with Neil? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, so in his thesis, he worked on variational inference uh, for Bayesian neural networks. And the right baseline to compare your variational approach could be the Laplace approximation, of course. Uh, so that's what the Neil Lawrence did. And he had this simple data set uh, and he was uh, fitting his uh, variational approach. It worked quite well. And then he applied the Laplace approximation and he used sampling instead of this linearized approach that David Mackay proposed. And we see here what are the results. So in these continuous lines, we see the map uh, solution for the Bayesian neural network, the point estimate of the weights, it fits the data quite well. And now we see in these continuous lines, the predictions obtained by Monte Carlo when you sample from your Gaussian. And this black line here is the average of those predictions. It doesn't even fit the data. <laughs> no, the average of your predictions with a Gaussian doesn't even fit the data. It's a horrible approximation. Your Gaussian approximation, when you sample from that, it's making an awful job at even describing the data. Uh, so this shows that this linearized approximation seems to be key for getting this method to work. Uh, 
And uh, that was this very good reason, uh, probably why uh, David Mackay was using it. Uh, why is this happening? Uh, we're going to have a break now, but we're going to see very quickly why the linear model is, is working and why this Gaussian is not working. The Gaussian is not working because if you think about the posterior, here I'm, I'm looking at the log, uh, the negative log posterior. So it's, so it's uh, values that describe the data and the prior well, take low inputs that describe the data and the prior well, they take low values here. Uh, what is going to happen is that the, the true posterior is going to curve quite quickly in some regions. And our Gaussian is just a local approximation at the mode. It might be very good, very close to the mode, but then as soon as you move away, the approximation is not so good. Now you see it here, your Gaussian shown in blue may move maybe more slowly, and then it may give high probability mass to regions that don't even fit the data. Uh, and the true posterior may be actually not following this quadratic function, but it may be curving faster. Uh, so a lot of mass from this Gaussian may fall in regions of low posterior density. And then when you sample from your Gaussian, then you will get very poor predictions that don't even fit the data. The linearized model don't, doesn't have this problem. It's a linear model with respect to the weights. So the predictions of this linear model are going to change very slowly, oh, sorry. They are going to change very slowly with respect to the weights, no? So if you look at it, here, this is now a linear function in W and then it's going to change very smoothly as a function of W, you know, it's a straight line. It cannot be more smooth than a straight line. Uh, so yeah, uh, we're going to see a bit more on this, why this linearized model is, is good uh, later. Uh, we're going to have a quick break now, and then uh, we'll continue having a look more at, at this and at more recent works in this area uh, very soon.